we looked at last time and stopped at in chapter 8, we stopped at verse 30. I'm going to read verse 30 as part of my introduction. We're going to be looking specifically up to verse 36 tonight. And we're going to see what Jesus says when he says that truth shall make you free. We'll be looking at that tonight. But I'll begin at verse 30, reading to verse 36. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? And Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So, in spite of the opposition, and as we've been going through John, we've noted that opposition is now occurring. But in spite of this opposition, there are still people who are listening to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, his words, though rejected by the Pharisees, well, his, his words have a ring of truth that draws people to him. And it seems, as we're looking at this passage, that, that, that some who are listening to him are inclined to think that what he is saying is true. Yet it also appears that they're not ready to completely yield their allegiance to him. And spiritually, that's a very dangerous place to be. To be somebody who says, well, these things may very well be true, but not to, to embrace them on a personal level is dangerous because what happens ultimately very often is the people who are inclined at least in that direction, at least being pulled or sensing a pulling in that direction, when they harden themselves against that, 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 that uh, sense of conviction and and all, when they harden themselves to that, it's a dangerous place because sometimes they harden themselves completely. It's a dangerous place to be where you, you know certain things sound true or most likely are true, but you decide against making a decision. You see, salvation isn't something that you put off for a later date. The message of Jesus isn't a message that gives you that kind of option. The message of the gospel is actually a message that demands a decision. Like it says in Luke eleven twenty three, 23, Jesus said it like this. He said, he who's not with me is against me, and he who does not gather uh, with me is scattering. And, and that's the truth. If you're not on his side and you're really in opposition, you're moving people away from him. And so Jesus is speaking to some people here. There are many who it says are beginning to believe in him. But in verse 31, it says to those Jews, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Now, let me give you a little technical lesson here for a moment. Notice how it says in verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him. One of my, or actually more than one of the commentators that I, that I looked to for instruction pointed something out. They said that the phrase or the term those Jews indicated something it, that that the term those Jews, and again he says to those Jews who believed him, those Jews may be speaking of the Jewish authorities, that there were people who were religious leaders who were listening to him, and that would be who it was being spoken, who was being spoken of here. Uh, there were some amongst what was called the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, there were some amongst the Sanhedrin uh, that believed that Jesus Christ could be Messiah. We know that because when you read your Bible, uh, two of those men are mentioned by name, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Both of them were leaders and rulers. They were part of the group uh, that could very well be being spoken of here when it refers to those Jews who believed him. There were others who thought he was Messiah in the sense of saying, well, he fits the bill. There are many things he's doing that fits into the Old Testament scriptures pertaining to Messiah. So there are many uh, amongst uh, the people who, who think that he could very well be Messiah, but we're not convinced. We'll see that later on in chapter 12 in verses 42 and 43, where it says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So there were leaders who were listening to Christ, 
men like Nicodemus, men like uh, Joseph of Arimathea. There were men that were listening who Jesus seems to be speaking to right here. And so when it says Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, he made a statement. He said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So he knew who these uncommitted ones were, were, so he is speaking to them. And notice what he says. He says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. The word abide, if you continually abide in it, if you do not waver, you are truly my disciple, but you must hold tightly to it. You must continue in it and not be moved away from it. That's what abiding speaks of. It gives us a, 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 the thought that, that we would be aware that we, we can be tempted to reject it and, and that there will be some who come to attempt to deceive us. Uh, you have to abide. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be resisted. But you must remain steadfast in it. When you came to faith in Christ, you found that to be true. When you came to faith in Christ, you more than likely discovered that not everybody rejoices when a sinner is found. And that sometimes there are people, your closest friends sometimes. It may be a family member, a mom or a dad, a grandmother. And sometimes they're just not excited about you becoming a Christian. They may be upset at that. Uh, as I've shared before, we've seen that many times here in this church. But I saw that long before I was pastoring. There was uh, a time when I was in the world, and and uh, I had just freshly gotten saved, and I was known as a, a person who liked to party and all of that. And and there was a young lady who was walking down the street in front of my house. I'll never forget this. I was brand new in the Lord, brand new. And she was walking down the street. She knew me from partying with me and all. And she stopped, and I was in front of my parents' house, and I was 20 years old. She was probably about 17 or 18. And she was a doper. I mean, just like me. She liked her drugs, just like I did. So she said, you know, something like, what are you up to now? And I said, man, I got saved. And, and I started a conversation with her. I said, yeah, I gave my heart to the Lord. She says, what are you talking about? And I still remember having a conversation with her. She says, well, I'm Catholic. Cause, and I said, well, I was raised Catholic, too. I know where you're coming from with that. I said, but the bottom line is, is I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and you knew me, and you knew what I was like. She goes, yeah. She says, I heard that something happened to you. And she says, now I see something happened to you. I said, yeah. And, I, and I've always carried little Bibles, you know, pocket Bibles and all. And I opened it up and read the little that I knew, shared the Lord with her. She said, I'm real interested in this. I said, can I come over and talk to you some more? So she gives me her address for her house. And I go to her house, and, and I sit down with her in her front room. Again, I'm 20 years old, long hair. You know, her mom and dad are looking at me while I'm talking to their daughter. They don't trust me. Why should they? But I'm sharing. And then I, I prayed with her, and I said, you want to give your heart to Christ? And she said, yes, I do. So I prayed with her. And uh, I saw her once after that. I had invited her to go to Calvary Chapel with me and our friends and all. And, and then I didn't see her, so I connected with her. And I said, what's going on? You know, I... You, you prayed to give your heart to Christ. I'm concerned for you. You know, I haven't seen you. She says, my mom and dad are not, not going to allow me to go to church with you because I was raised Catholic, and they said to me, you were raised Catholic, you will die Catholic. And, and I said, they would prefer you as a doper than a Christian. And she said, yeah, they would prefer me a doper than a Christian. And she was a party girl. And she had given her heart to the Lord. Her life was going to be different. There are a lot of people like that. I could multiply stories like that. Probably should, but I don't have the time. I've seen a lot of that over the years where people would rather have their kid in drugs. And, and that may blow your mind. And you may think I'm exaggerating, but that's not true. We got a phone call here in the church. A woman said to us, I, I could handle my son as an alcoholic, but I can't handle him as a Christian. You know, she wanted him back in the old world because she was used to him that way. But when he became a Christian and had been changed and all, she didn't like that. We've seen that many times. So when you get saved, it's not always something people, you know, have a party for you and, and kill the fatted calf. They're not always happy for you. Sometimes they're angry at you. When my wife Marie and I were dating and she said, it's time for me to get water baptized. And so we went out on a Sunday night and we went to church, a church that had baptisms. And my wife, my girlfriend at the time, you know, decides to take the plunge. 
And so she goes into the water, comes out, her hair is soaking wet. I drive her home. I pull into the driveway. Her mom's a very strong, strong religious Catholic woman. And I turn to Marie and I said, she said, my mom's going to be mad. I said, you want me to go in with you? And she says, no. I said, thank you, Jesus. You know, I said, do it. God be with you, my, my daughter. And she went in and mom let her know how she was not happy about this. You've experienced it. Some of you have. I did. My brother's running around calling me a nut and calling me names. And, oh, I've seen you and, and you've gone through fads and this is just another fad. We've seen it. Not everybody rejoices when you come to faith in Christ. Not everybody gets excited about that. And there is persecution and there is rejection. And, and so Jesus says you need to abide. You need to hold fast to. You continue in. You persevere. You're not moved away. You're going to be tempted to reject it. There are going to be those who actually creep in and attempt to deceive you. But hold fast to my word. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul said it like this. He said, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Remain immovable. In Hebrews 3, 14, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So by continuing in, by believing, and by obeying the word of the Lord, Jesus said, you will demonstrate yourself to be my disciple. Now, there are those who call themselves Christian, but over, their t over time, their lack of faith is revealed, and they forsake him. There are a lot of people who will, if you speak to them, and they'll say, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm already a Christian. But over time, you'll see that they never really had a substance of faith. There are some who might have have gone forward at a, at a church service or raised their hand at an invitation or gone forward at a crusade or whatever, but they don't remain. They don't follow through. And over time, their lack of faith is revealed, and they ultimately walk away. In 1 John 2, 19, John said it like this. He said, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. There are people who go to church and sometimes they'll go for weeks at a time, maybe even months at a time, sometimes years at a time. And you might very well think they're Christians when in fact they're not. They're simply going to church. But a genuine disciple continues in the gospel and holds tightly to Christ. And that's what he's saying. And they do that to the end, which is evidence of being a real believer in Christ. So Jesus is saying that the identifying mark of a genuine Christian is abiding in his word. In, in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he asks a question. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? In Matthew 7, 21, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So the identifying mark of a genuine believer is abiding in his word. And so Jesus is giving us insight into what it means to be a disciple, a genuine Christian. If you take notes, you might want to note that the word disciple or disciples is used some 297 times in the New King James Version of the New Testament. A disciple is someone who comes to learn and becomes a lifelong pupil of Jesus. When you read your Bible, there are distinguishing traits of a disciple. Again, Jesus is speaking to them, and he says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. In the New Testament, a disciple is identified as, as a, a person who puts the kingdom of God first before any other thing. In Luke 14, 33, Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. A disciple is going to be known for good works. In Acts 9.36, it speaks of a woman named Tabitha who lived in a city named Joppa. And it says this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. And so a genuine disciple puts the kingdom first. A genuine disciple is known for good works. A third thing is a disciple knows Jesus 
and follows him, especially when times are difficult. In Luke 14, 27, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then a fourth thing is a disciple is known. And this is something that I think is extremely important along with the other things I was mentioning. But here's a key for you. A disciple is someone who loves, who loves God and loves people. There's hardly anything more unchristian than a hater. That somebody who's always hating and always mad, you know? I had a friend of mine, a minister, and one of my friends was saying, well, what's he mad about today? You know, because every time he every time he'd preach, he was mad about something, you know? Uh, here's the thing, guys, and, um, and it isn't just because I was a hippie and I thought love was the coolest thing, though I did. But here's the thing. Every one of us is known for some trait. Every one of us is. You have a reputation. What is it? If I were to ask your best friend, can you tell me what the distinguishing trait about your best friend is? What would they say about you? And I'm not saying that to be negative. I'm, I'm, I'm asking a sincere question. What would they say about you? What would they say? You, you asked one of my kids, you know, what's your dad like? And they gave you a real answer. That kind of thing. I wouldn't have a problem with that. They can tell the truth. Because what I try to be is a man of God in front of them. I would hope that they would say that. If they didn't, they're not my kids. I'd get rid of them. <laughs> but if you ask me, you know, if you boil it down, what is a Christian? A Christian forsakes everything to follow Jesus Christ. A Christian is part of a community of other believers, and they love one another. In the, in the early days of the church, one of the uh, Roman writers was writing concerning the church, and he was a pagan. He was not a believer, but he said, these are people who love one another. And Jesus had said that, hadn't he? He said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. That is the mark of the believer. People have birthmarks. Maybe you have a birthmark. I have a birthmark. We have birthmarks. What is your birthmark? As a believer, what is your distinguishing trait? What is it that you're known for? On the job, in a neighborhood where people may know you. You know, I've lived in my neighborhood 20 some years and everybody stays behind doors. It's odd. It's really weird in my neighborhood. It really is. Uh, it's a prison. No, it, it, it's just, it's weird. They're all behind their doors. You know, we, we've said hello to our next door neighbors a few times. Uh, a neighbor on the other side doesn't want, doesn't want to talk to us for whatever reason. I don't know. And, and my whole neighborhood is really closed up. But the ones that you get to know, what do they know about you? What is it? What is it? What, do you, what will your friends say? What will your family say? Uh, what do your co-workers say? If you go to school, what do the people that are with you in school say? What is your reputation? If you don't think that matters, it really does. It really does. And what do they think about you? And what do they say about you? And, and for me, I, I'm hoping that those who get to know me will say, this is a person who loves the Lord and cares about other people. Because that's what Jesus said is a Christian. That's a disciple. And he's speaking concerning the earmarks of a disciple. And he makes it clear that a disciple is someone who loves. But Jesus gives us more insight here, guys. Jesus gives us insight into both salvation as well as discipleship. And, and he says it's not just saying we believe. It's really what would be called a total commitment of our life, so everything to him. And salvation is evidenced by a settled conviction as well as spiritual freedom that is found in him. So he says in verse 31, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So abiding in his word is a mark of a genuine Christian. It's a mark of a real believer. The word abide means to remain, sojourn, to continue in, it speaks of lasting or enduring. It's easy to be attracted to Jesus in a superficial way, even as obviously some of these people were. During the Jesus movement, the movement that I came out of, some were attracted 
to Jesus Christ. I can't recreate the environment or the time just talking to you. But there were some who were attracted to Jesus because he was portrayed as really cool. And it's hard for me to make that clear to you because it may sound kind of like I'm not serious, but I am. He was a hippie. I saw Jesus as a hippie. All the pictures I ever saw of him, he had long hair, right? He had a beard. He wore cool sandals. I mean, I, he was mellow. You know, he loved people, hung around with the guys, had, had visits around campfires. I mean, everything I saw about Jesus, he was just, and I don't mean this sacrilegiously, I really don't, but as a non-believer, I saw him as a very cool man. And he was quoted a lot, and songs were sung about him during the time that I was young. And you would see this about him. He cared about those who were hurting. He would meet physical needs. He healed people who were sick. He fed those who were hungry. He spoke out against injustice. He, he railed against religious hypocrisy. He was very attractive to hippies, very attractive, very loving, very loving. And so during the Jesus movement, not every person claiming Jesus was actually being saved. There were those who kind of wanted to be fringe believers. That's, that's been going on since he walked the face of the earth. They, they were attracted to the things they heard of him and things that perhaps they'd heard someone say through the Bible studies or something. They were fringe believers. They, they were attracted to him because he was packaged as cool. Even today, people are superficially attracted to him. He can make you well. He can make you wealthy. He can make your dreams come true. And he's packaged as being cool and accepting of everything and everybody. Well, what makes the difference? What makes the difference between a superficial kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, and a genuine believer? Jesus says it. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples. The reality of the Christian faith is revealed by your hunger for the word of God. Spiritual hunger, satisfied by God's word, is an evidence of salvation. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, the prophet said, your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Job 23, 12. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word of God, that you may grow thereby. It's not only respecting God's word, it's building your entire life upon it. It's making the word of God your foundation for your entire way of life and thinking. I got saved. During that day, I would have been called what today is referred to as a liberal. Liberal in you know, I was that guy that, I won't bother you if you don't bother me. That guy, believe what you want. Don't get too carried away with it. Believe what you want. Just allow me the freedom to believe what I want. We'll get along fine. Don't push your beliefs on me. I won't push my beliefs on you. That was me. So they, someone would speak to me about issues on occasion. What do you think about this? And I'd say, it doesn't bother me. That's not my life. I don't do those things. So it didn't really matter to me whether it was for me. I'll give you an example. For me, if you'd have said, um, should we legalize drugs? I'd have said all drugs. Yeah, why not? Why not? Legalize them all. Uh, a friend of mine and I we were sitting down, and I have to confess we were not in our right mind. We were doing some drugs. And, and so we created an idea how we could fix the city of Whittier. The way we can fix the city of Whittier is get enough acid to drop in one of the reservoirs so everybody would get a hit and then everything would be fine. 
And we thought that was a great idea, you know, as we're sitting there smoking dope. So that was me. And so I, you know, stealing, well, don't steal what I have, but if you need it to survive, I don't care. You name it. Whatever the moral issue was, I had no backbone. I had no opinion. I didn't really care. Then I got saved. And, and you know what happened? I started reading the Bible. And when I started reading the Bible, I started getting questions. And then I started having arguments, like a guy who was telling me that it's okay to smoke pot. It's all right, because God created the herb. Now, we used to call marijuana herb. And so he said, the Bible says it right there. He created the herbs. And, and, and I'm a brand new believer. And he says, so you could have herb. You can use herb. It's okay. And I said, yeah, but he also, there's also poison ivy. And you don't use that for toilet paper. So why are you? And we would have arguments, deep theological arguments. But we would, we would have arguments over things because I'm starting to read stuff. And it's changing my mind about what I thought was okay. So after all of these years, I don't call myself by the name the lot. Oh, he's conservative. He's progressive. He's liberal, whatever. I, I don't think those labels are, they're too handy. I don't use those labels. But I can tell you, my belief system is born out from my scriptural reading. What I see God say in his word, that's what I want to believe. I want to abide in his word. I want to do what he says. My heart needs to be planted on that. It's not simply reading. It's the obeying that changes the life. And I want to obey. In Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite devotional writers, said, not Bible reading, but Bible obeying counts with God. And the winners will not be known until we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But it's not Bible reading, but Bible obeying. So in the hunger for God and willing obedience to him, his truth is progressively understood. And that's what he says in verse 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, these listeners believed that they knew what truth was. They spent their entire lifetime studying the scriptures. But in spite of all their studying, they still failed to see what the scriptures were actually saying. Jesus speak, spoke of that in John 5, 39. Remember, he said, you search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify me. You ransack the scriptures because you think in knowing them, you're going to have life. But they reveal me to you and you're denying me. That's the point he was making. So it's not simply the study of the Bible, but coming to know the author of the Bible that frees you. Again, Tozer said, one important point may fail uh, many fail to understand is that the Bible was never meant to replace God. Rather, it was meant to lead us into the heart of God. Too many Christians stop with the text and never go on to experience the presence of God. There are people who know the Bible and are able to quote it, but they don't have fellowship with the author of Scripture. So it's not simply the reading of and studying of, it's getting to know the author. You see, these Jews profess to know the truth, and to be the official expounders of it. They had yet to learn that truth was not only a system, but also a power. Not only something to be written or spoken, but also something to be felt and lived. So knowing the truth that sets you free begins with knowing the God who is the truth. In John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And when I got saved, I had friends saying, why, why don't you drink anymore? Why don't you smoke pot anymore? And, you know, and they said, oh, because you can't. And I said, no, I, I can. I mean, I have the freedom to go out and buy whatever, to smoke whatever. I can. Well, then why don't you? I said, because I don't want to. God took the want to out of my heart. That want to was no longer there. I don't want to drink anymore. I don't want to smoke dope anymore. I don't want to do those things anymore. Why? Because when you taste of the bread of life, when you drink of the water of life, you thirst and hunger for nothing else. That's what happens when you're saved. I, I don't want anything else. It's not that I couldn't experiment with something or do something, 
It's because I have a relationship with God. And so knowing the truth begins with knowing the God of truth. And it's not what we call it a philosophic knowledge that frees us from intellectual ignorance. What it is is called relational or experiential knowledge that comes from being in fellowship with God. In John 17, 3, Jesus said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So an author by the name of Albert Barnes said, to know speaks of love, reverence, obedience, honor, gratitude, and supreme affection. To know God as he is, is to know and regard him as a lawgiver, a sovereign, a parent, a friend. It is to yield the whole soul to him and to strive to obey his law. To know the Lord, to know him, is to yield yourself completely to God. This is a place where I think a lot of professing Christians have failed to step into, is that their Christianity is part-time. It's, uh, it's, it's a seasonal or part-time, but your Christianity isn't. Your Christianity is relational. It's, it's a knowledge of God that uh, when you close your eyes, you are with him. When you open your eyes, you're with him. You're with him at all time because you have fellowship with him at all time. You don't just wear your religion on a Wednesday night like tonight or on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or some event. Your faith in Christ is what drives you in everything that you do. It's not just on sometimes the, the way you may wear certain clothes at certain seasons. It's, no, your Christianity is at all times in every moment, and it grows. Your, your, your love for Christ grows. Your fellowship with God grows. It's, it's a knowledge that expands, and it's experiential in that you get to know him, and you know his ways. There's a point where you know his, the things he does, and then there's a point where you begin to grow to know why he does those things. And that's when you understand the things of the Lord. It's not just that you know that he does certain things. It's when you begin to know why he does those things. That's deep fellowship. You can, members of my church know things that I do. They know things that I do. Oh, Pastor Dave, yeah, he prays with people. He, he teaches Bible studies. He, he does certain things. He travels. He ministers. But my wife can tell you why I do those things. Some people can tell you I do those things. My wife can tell you why I do those things. You can know that God did some things, but there are others who know why he does those things, and that's knowing God. That's a relationship with him that goes beyond simply, oh, I read it. and No, is I put it into practice. He's manifested himself to me. I have a sense of, of fellowship with God that goes beyond, beyond anything. Well, as Jesus is speaking, he says in verse 32, you shall know the truth, it'll make you free. But they answer him in verse 33. <laughs> We're Abraham's descendants. Have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? And so they, they want to argue with him. Interestingly, isn't it? But they do. They want to argue with him. Now, these are the ones who just said they believe in him. And they thought they're already free. Now, why would they say that? Well, they thought they were automatically heirs to the promise that was given to their father, Abraham. In Genesis 17, the first book of the Bible, chapter 17, verses 7 and 8, God said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. I'll be their God. So they had physical descent. But physical descent didn't make them heirs to the promise. Those promises were received by faith and acted on with obedience. And notice how they said, this is interesting to me, we've never been in bondage to anyone. What a, what a ridiculous thing to say. We have, you know, we're Abraham's descendants, have never been in bondage to anyone. They forgot their history. They were in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years. They, they were in bondage to Assyria. They were in bondage to Babylon. They were in bondage to the Medo-Persians. They were in bondage to Greece. And even as they were speaking, they're in bondage to Rome. And yet they're saying, 
We've never been in bondage to anyone. And so Jesus, as they say that, makes it more clear. Because they say, how can you say you'll be made free? Well, Jesus, verse 34, answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. He said, most assuredly, whoever commits sin is a slave. The word commit, that means to practice or make a habit of. It speaks of a lifestyle. And he says, if you commit it, you're a servant. That word servant speaks of a slave, someone in bondage to someone else. Jesus is saying, every man who makes a habit of sin, who continues in sin, is a slave to sin. That's what he's saying. And in Proverbs 20, verse 11, even a child is known by his deeds, whether what he does is pure and right. What you believe is what you do. And the proof of our faith is revealed by our response to the word of God. How do I respond to what the Bible says is right? And how do I respond to what the Bible says is wrong? Do I listen? Do I become convicted? Or do I make an excuse or argue with it? That helps you to know your spiritual condition. When the word of God brings conviction, how do you respond? When I'm reading the Bible and it says something, how do I respond? Because that helps me to see the sincerity of my faith. Because Jesus said, if you're committing sin, you're a slave of it. When he speaks of committing, he said he who commits, whoever commits. That word commit is not speaking of an occasional sinful act. All of us sin in thought, word, or deed daily. None of us is perfect. Well, only one. No, none of us is perfect, right? All of us fail. All of us do. He's not saying that you're going to be perfect this side of heaven. What he's talking about is a way of life. Whoever commits it habitually, that's their way of life. And so he's saying this is going to be demonstrating what you really believe. So everybody who continues to commit sin um, as a habit is what he's referring to. But we have been given by God a new nature. When you're born again and set free by Christ, we have now a new nature. Now we will occasionally sin. We will continue to sin until the day we die. But by abiding in him, the power of his Holy Spirit, we live a more pure life over time. In Romans 6, verses 13 and 14, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. I had to get to a point in my life, and I'll say this quickly. I had to get to the point in my life where I stopped making excuses and just started embracing the reality. You know, yeah, I'm outspoken. My mom was outspoken. Yeah, I say things that are on my mind. I learned to do that in my house. That was our way. And, and so I bring that into my friendships. I bring that into relationships. I brought it into my marriage. You know, yeah, if it's on your mind, speak it. You're a hypocrite if you don't. And then I learned that not everything needs to be said. And I started learning that some things that you say need to be, they need, it needs to be sweetened with love. And I started learning certain things over time. And I stopped making excuses by just saying that's the way I was raised. Or that's my culture. Because sometimes people say, well, that's just my culture. You know, we do that in my culture. But, you know, what if the scripture says that what you're doing in your culture is wrong? How do you respond to that? And that's how it is. When you're reading the word of God, you need to understand these things. You see, slaves are in bondage. They have no freedom. They can't free themselves. They need someone to set them free. The Bible in Proverbs 5.22 says, His own iniquities entrap the wicked man. He's caught in the cords of his sin. In 2 Peter 2.19, 2 a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. 
So what we need to do as believers tonight is remember, we've been set free. We receive the truth from Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, a slave doesn't abide in the house forever, a son does. A lifetime of bondage and eventually dying as a slave is what happens to the person who's never come to faith in Christ. Slaves normally never belong to a family, even if they lived in the same house. But Jesus said, a son abides forever. You see, with a son, things are different. A son is an heir. A son has family rights. And that's why he says in verse 36, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I'm the son in my father's house. I have heavenly rights and I give you freedom. And if you receive me, you will receive complete freedom from the bondage that you live in. In Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you're slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And it's this freedom that we have in Christ that gives us the ability to understand we're just passing through. I'll close with just a couple of thoughts. Um, I was speaking to a friend of mine today who was in, he just returned from Rome. And he was telling me that he went through the city, he and his wife. And he said, you know, when you look around the city and the guide is telling you what Rome was like in its, in its days of grandeur, he said, it's amazing. You look at the Colosseum. He said, and, and you can imagine, this is a structure that's lasted for hundreds of years. He said, there it is in the center of the city. And he says, you look at it, and you realize that this, this Colosseum was a place that had a lot of athletic events, but it also was given over to the, to the destruction of Christians. He says, or you go to the Forum, and, and you see what used to be a beautiful place a, what would have been a beautiful sight. He said, there's so many things you see. That, and, and, and can you imagine, he was saying, how beautiful the city of Rome was. He said, but we went to a, a site that there weren't any tourists. He said, you go to the, these other areas and there'll be lines of tourists waiting to get in to see the grandeur that was Rome. He said, but we went to a site where we were supposed to be there at 8.30 a.m. We got there at 8. It was just us for a half hour. It was called the Mamertine Prison. He said, it's the site where the apostle Paul had been imprisoned. He said, and we're outside of the Mamertine Prison there. And you read some of the letters Paul wrote, Second Timothy being one of them, his last letter. He said, and you get tears in your eyes because this is a man, all you need to do is read his letters, read his writings, and you see it about him. A man who said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. In other words, I've been in plenty and I've been in little. This is a man who had traveled the world. This is a man who was articulate. This is a man who was educated. This is, he was the premier intellectual of his, of his day. This is a man who had seen everything. A man who'd been to a lot of places. A man who had a lot of influential friends. A man who experienced a lot of things the average person will never experience. Sometimes, sometimes I'll hear people who are, who are highly educated and they begin to speak with other friends who are highly educated and I know I have no place in their conversation. I haven't got a clue what they're talking about and they're speaking so, so casually. Sometimes I've, I've seen people who have, have a good amount of money and, and things that I would think are, oh my goodness, that really must cost a ton. Those are things that they use and throw away because they don't matter that much to them because they got so much money. And you hear numbers today. I'll hear numbers today, like a billion. And to me, a billion, that's an amazing number. None of us really knows what that is, but it's thrown around so much that it's become almost nothing. We use the word trillion now because billion doesn't seem to convey that much. So you hear that somebody had $115 million, and I say, that's, that's not that much. 
because this guy got four billion, this guy's got 70 billion, this guy, and, and you think that way and you get that way and, and these people can have so much money and do so many things and have so much freedom and can spend it. And it's not that it's bad or good, it just is. And, and, and that's their life, right? And then I think of Paul. And my friend, as he was speaking, I said, you know, that's very profound what you're sharing with me right now. It speaks to my heart because you've got a guy named Paul, a Paul who a guy who knew how to abound and how to be abased. He knew how to be everything in between. And this is the guy who said, I've learned the secret of contentment. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And yet this is a guy who's in a prison, a small cell that you, you could he could never get out of. And the light that came in was through a ceiling where there was a hole where the sun would occasionally come through. He did not have anything, anything. And he's writing his last letter. And he says, all have forsaken me. Only Luke is with me. And he says, Demas has forsaken me. My friend, my traveling companion, I'm a fellow missionary, a helper in, my, in service to the Lord. My friend Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He has departed to Thessalonica. We're talking about that today. And yet Jesus is saying, you shall know the truth. It'll make you free. Paul was in prison, but he was free. And those people who were wandering around on the streets, going to the Colosseum, going here, going there, they were in bondage. They were the ones who were the slaves. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying he who commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave will not abide in the house forever, but the son abides forever. Therefore, whoever the son sets free, he is free indeed. So it isn't finances that set me free. It isn't education that set me free. It wasn't relationships with someone who loves me deeply that set me free. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ who sets me free. And that comes through the word of God. And that's what Jesus is saying to those disciples who say they believed in him. And he knows they don't. And he knows they don't. He says, no, if you commit sin, you're a slave of sin. You will not abide in the house forever. Oh, we're no slaves. We've never been in bondage to anyone. Oh, yes, you have. You're in bondage right now. But I'm not speaking about an empire. I'm speaking of your personal life that is in bondage to sin. And if you want to be set free, you have to have a relationship with Jesus. So it's more than just knowing about him. It's knowing him. This is eternal life, knowing thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's where your freedom comes from. Jesus Christ.